Just let Ken talk. Ken? Thank you, David. Thank you very much, and thank you all for uh, showing up on this, what I was expecting might be a rainy day, but looked like Seattle gave us some sun. But it is a sad day. Uh, it's probably not usual, but I wrote a little obituary for J28 because I thought it would be quite useful for our society to know these whales as individuals, as endangered icons that we are just about to lose. J-28 was born in the midwinter, 92-93, in or near Puget Sound, probably not far from where we stand right now. She was the first of four known calves born to J-17 in the J-9, J-5 lineage. The grandma and great-grandma were alive when we began this study. And they inhabited the inshore and the coastal marine waters of Washington State, British Columbia. The iconic and world-famous J-1, first southern resident killer whale ever to be photo identified by Dr. Mike Big, was her father. Photographs of J-28 that were taken in the summer of 1993 by Center for Whale Research staff and Earthwatch volunteers that helped us at the time show that she was healthy and vigorous. She was not a loser among six new calves that were born that year. I'm gonna change hands here. Uh, in late autumn 2002, when she was nine years old, she acquired a small nick in the trailing edge of her dorsal fin that made her easily identifiable to whale watchers and the general public, and she became one of the darlings for a growing fan club of humans that were beginning to raise concern that this iconic population was precipitously declining from 100 in 1995 to 80 in 2003. The southern resident killer whale population was declared endangered under the U.S. Endangered Species Act in 2005, and earlier this year, it was listed as a species in the spotlight by NOAA for its lack of recovery since being designated endangered. Sexual maturity for these immensely popular neighbor animals is typically attained in the early to mid-teens, and J-28 had her first known calf, a daughter J-46, in November 2009 when she was 16 years old. Gestation's about 17 months, so we can estimate that J-28 became pregnant at age 14 and a half. That's about right. In January 2013, three years after the birth of J-46, a freshly dead neonate calf was found on Dungeness Spit and identified from DNA as belonging to J-28. She was the mom. And the presumed father, also identified by DNA, was L-41. The dead calf was not given an alphanumeric designation because it had not been documented alive. She subsequently She subsequently had her, uh, after the dead calf, had her second live-born calf, J-54, in December 2015 at the end of that baby boom that we remember the last two years. Regrettably, now that mother has died, he will not survive, and he, and in fact, probably is already dead, along with two other of the boomers, J-55 and L-120. J-28 was noted to be losing body condition in January 2016, presumably from birthing complications, and by J July was clearly emaciated. If her carcass is ever found, an examination of her ovaries may reveal how many ovulations and pregnancies she actually had, as well as her proximate cause of death, which we think is septicemia. We estimate she died in the Strait of Juan de Fuca sometime between the 16th and 18th of October this, this month. She was first noted missing on the 19th of October. 
J-28 is survived by her mother, J-17, two sisters, J-35 and 53, a brother, J-44, a daughter, J-46, a nephew, J-47, her daughter and her oldest sister are attempting to care for the orphan calf, but at 10 months of age, he's too young to survive without mother's milk supplement, and he has gone too long with inadequate nutrition. No other lact lactating females have adopted him, and his grandmother is too occupied raising her own newest calf, J53, that was born last October. His sister has been catching and offering salmon to mother and her little brother for several months. She's trying, but they're simply not, she can't work hard enough and catch enough to feed three whales. The family requests that in lieu of sending flowers and cake, well-wishers please send more wild Chinook salmon to and from Pacific Northwest rivers. Now, uh, this allude to cake is taken from a interview by uh, the messiah of dam builders, Floyd Dominey, who in response to questions from the press about, well, we know the dams are going to kill the fish, uh, what about the fishermen? And he said, they can eat cake. We know the whales can't eat cake. We know they need Chinook salmon. We know that the dams prevented at least a million Chinook salmon from currently being in the ecosystem that they depend upon. And uh, that's why I've linked this to dams. But the story goes longer than just now. All along, for years now, we've had whales dying. I've, I had my background prior to starting this study 50 years ago, or 40 years ago, 50 years ago, I was uh, working for the federal government, looking at dead whales, trying to figure out how many babies they had and how long they lived and all kinds of uh, scientific facts. And one of the ways you can do this is you can obtain the ovaries and you can see, you can count. Every time they ovulate, there's a blister in the ovary. Every time that ovulation results in a pregnancy, uh, the blister enlarges and becomes a hormone gland that provides uh, for the development of the fetus. And uh, after the fetus is born or miscarried, that a bulbous hormone gland regresses and leaves a white scar. So you can count the number of pregnancies, you can count the number of ovulations. And we've noted in so many females that uh, we, obviously we've been taking photographs of every live calf they have, but there's uh, about three times as many dead calves that they must have had they're losing their offspring in utero or very soon after birth due to a, a really tragic human caused situation where when they don't get enough food, they depend upon their body fat, their blubber, for the energy needed to develop the fetus or nurse it. And this body fat is toxic when it's metabolized and circulated in the body. If you keep them fed and fat, they'll only get the toxins from the food they're eating, which is a much lower level than in their own body. So the way to save these whales is to just feed them as much as we can. And I've gotten on a bandwagon of removal of the Snake River dams because they are basically obsolete fish killers and they're costing us money. And we've brought along Jim Waddell, who's uh, a retired Army Corps of Engineer, engineer, who's 
really the expert on why this can be done and why it could be done quickly. And we do have to act quickly. We're running out of reproductive animals in this population. So uh, thank you all for your interest. Uh, I hope I don't have to read too many of these obituaries. I'm sure there will be a few more. And I know that uh, we've, I could list the ones and we have it on the press package that we've examined that we know what killed them. So Jim, if 